This is a presentation of SBE 15 New York City. I can uh, hand the uh, reins over to our um, past president and certification, national certification chairman, Ralph Hogan. Thank you, Conrad. Uh, it's a nice introduction. We uh, are looking forward to educating uh, some of the members tonight on what uh, the certification program is. A lot of people know the different pieces of certification, but we're going to cover the whole program. And for those in the audience who are new to SBE or just wanting to know more about certification, uh, Megan's here with me. So at the end, we'll have an opportunity for anyone to ask questions if we don't cover the information that you're interested in uh, during the presentation or if questions come up. Uh, Conrad, uh, do you have a problem that people just ask questions uh, during the presentation or would you rather wait till the end? Uh, open forum, whatever you feel comfortable with, Ralph. If if you don't mind um, people hopping in, then that's that's okay by us. I'm I'm okay with that. The uh, sometimes you get bogged down with the question upon question, but if that happens, then we'll change them, our mode. But I I think at this point we'll just have an open forum. So if anyone okay. has a question while we're going through the material, just uh, ask, and we'll try and address it either myself or Megan. So why do you, you want to become certified? There are a lot of professionals out there that who hold certifications, uh, plumbers, mechanics, accountants, they have uh, certifications that they go through and not only do they get certified, but they have to recertify to keep those credentials. And that's the same with SBE. So we want to make sure that uh, you can express your knowledge uh, by taking a proficiency exam and passing that exam. And once you become certified, one of the things we really want everyone to do uh, because the technology is moving so quickly is to work on your professional development and continue to become educated and that's part of the recertification process. Broadcast engineers uh, are working more and more hours these days and it's important that uh, they get recognized or you get recognized for the work that you do. Uh, one of the things that uh, Conrad alluded to is that uh, when you do a a resume and you can put in that uh, you have a certification as part of your resume. A lot of times that helps uh, within the industry and in the professional realm. Uh, job descriptions, a lot of them in the broadcast arena, uh, one of the criteria they have is uh, indicating that SBE certification is preferred. Generally, it's not required what is preferred so two equally uh, competent people applying for a job and one is certified and one is not the one that's certified in most cases will have a, an edge on getting uh, hired you want to make sure that you continue to uh, increase your knowledge the technology moves so quickly and uh, you don't have much of an opportunity to, to really dwell on much of anything anymore because uh, if you blink your eyes, the technology has changed. So this is a way you can benchmark your achievements by taking a snapshot in time uh, when you take your certification exam and then through recertification, you can upgrade those uh, knowledge factors. The uh, objectives of Certification is to raise the status of broadcast engineers, providing standards and professional competence in the practice of broadcast engineering and related technologies. It's also to recognize those individuals by fulfilling the requirements of knowledge, experience, responsibility, conduct, 
to meet those standards of professional competence. And it's also one of the things that the SBE chapters are, are generally good at is they encourage their members to continue their professional development. And by having meetings like this, where you talk about the technology, you talk about what's going on in the industry, and also uh, exposing the members to their certification program, it's a good way to take and uh, continue that professional development. So which uh, level of certification is, is good for you? There are a number of different certifications that SBE has. There are eight engineering certifications, one network engineer certification, two operator certifications, one broadcast networking technologist certification, and four specialist certifications. And we'll go through each of those different certifications so you have an idea of what, what they are and what's expected uh, if you sit for one of the exams. We classify our certifications into groups. The lowest uh, entry level group is the operator level certification. This is the certified radio operator and the certified television operator. The next one up would be the broadcast networking certification, which deals with uh, networking technologists and the certified broadcast engineer. The CBNT, uh, as you notice, doesn't say engineer, it says technologist. So by having technologists as part of the certification, the expectation is that the knowledge that you have to have to gain that certification is not as great as if you were an engineer in one of the engineering certifications. The engineering level certifications, there's eight of those, and I'm not gonna read through them because we're gonna go through them individually, but there are eight uh, engineering level certifications. And then there are four cert specialist certifications. And these deal with uh, areas within the broadcast arena that uh, allows an individual to take and test and show their proficiency for additional knowledge in a specific area. So which certification's uh, best for you? You have to make that decision on your own. A lot of it uh, might come from just your experience and your background, but you're able to attempt any level of certification for which you're qualified by testing directly at that level. One of the things that we, we as in SBE uh, do not require prerequisite certification levels. So you don't have to get one certification before you get another one. There is an exception with that for CPBE, the, Certified Professional Broadcast Engineer. That, for that level, you have to already have hold an SBE senior level certification, either in radio or television. So going back to the entry level uh, operator certifications, we have a couple of handbooks that uh, we uh, have some of our SBE members have developed over time. And those handbooks actually have all the material that's necessary to, to master the, uh, the knowledge that's needed to successfully uh, complete the radio operator or the television operator. We have a number of schools that uh, around the country, and actually Megan has told me recently that the number it seems to even be growing when the number of schools who are utilizing these uh, operator handbooks to teach uh, students some of the basics of broadcasting. 
for those who have been in the industry for a while, you know that a lot of the operations that you had to do hands-on work is now all being automated. And there's a lot of master control operations that there's really no one in the master control anymore. There's basically all those functions have been delegated to automation systems and automated uh, monitoring, but you still have to know what's going on. And if something should happen, you need to know how to address it. So these entry level courses are actually good to give you a good foundation to start with. Certified Broadcast Technologies is a certification that you achieve uh, by not necessarily taking an exam. If you hold a general radio television license, a radio tele telephone license, or the FCC amateur extra class license, and have two years of continuous satisfactory service in either broadcast engineering or related technology, you can achieve the certified broadcast technologist certification without taking an exam. The general radio telephone license provided by the FCC was uh, phased out in 1984. So there's less and less people now that actually have those licenses, but there are still some around. And occasionally we see uh, them bringing their old license in to become uh, CBT uh, certified. Certified Broadcast Networking Technologist is, uh, again, this is a technologist exam. This is uh, our knowledge that someone needs. And it's a basic networking technologies. It's not uh, designing a multifaceted, multi-router specific uh, system but it is testing your knowledge of basic uh, networking principles. So this is a good way to get started for those who have some basically IP uh, background and knowledge. And once you take and become the broadcast network technologist, then as you become more proficient in IP and network uh, design and network engineering, then you can move on into the um, network engineer position. We have two uh, two areas that uh, the certified video engineer and the certified radio engineer, the CVE. Uh, these two are Basically, we found that there are people who work in the studios, never go to a transmitter site. So they never gain any real RF knowledge. So these uh, two uh, non-engineering positions are basically for those uh, people who work in the studios, either recording studio or TV studio or uh, not necessarily going up to a transmitter site. The Certified Broadcast Networking Engineer, the CBNE, uh, requires five years of experience and the exam is designed for experienced broadcasts uh, Engineers having a significant experience in IP networks and associated storage and playout technologies that are employed in radio and television stations. This is uh, an area that a lot of people who are working in the industry now, that, that is one of the areas that's really grown over the past 15 years or so, uh, since everything has become pretty much IP centric and have to work within networks, within broadcast plants is uh, 
this is a good experience uh, for someone to have a CB and E. So the uh, senior level radio and television engineers requires 10 years of work. Uh, and also in addition to the multiple choice uh, questions that you have, you also have an essay question that's part of the exam. And the essay question is actually to test your knowledge. It's a practical, a uh, question of what a broadcast engineer might run into uh, in their job. One thing I'd like to take and point out for those uh, who want to sit for the senior level exams and they fill out the application, make sure when you're describing experience and your background, be sure not to pad that area of the application only put experience that you actually have knowledge of. And the reason why I say that is because the certification committee looks at each of these applications for senior level and they assign the essay questions based upon what's on the application. So if someone puts a bunch of information that they have no knowledge of on the application, they may end up with a question they have no, not a clue on how to answer it. So uh, the Best way to do that is just cover the areas, even if it's less information on the uh, application, put those areas that you, you feel that you have a good background in. Also, we have a, an opportunity to substitute for experience for those who have gone to uh, engineering schools or have uh, associate degrees, associated degrees, bachelor's degrees. And um, so uh, some of that 10 years credit can be uh, credited with an engineering degree. Might shorten your time. If you've gotten into the broadcast industry, you don't have to wait the full 10 years working at a station or um, to get that background, you can utilize your engineering degree or your bachelor's degree to help uh, make that 10 years go a little quicker. Now, our highest level of certification is the Certified Professional Broadcast Engineer. You have to be a senior certified with a minimum of 20 years professional broadcast engineering or related technology experience. There are a lot of people who are qualified to apply for the CPBE, and I've talked to a number of them over the years, uh, they have a senior level certification, they have the 20 years, but they just don't fill out the paperwork. And this is actually just a paperwork exercise to get CPBE. You've done the hard work, becoming senior certified, and to become CPBE, you need two letters of reference from either other CPBE or certified broadcast engineers, or if you have uh, work with the state registered uh, PE, you can get them to write a letter for you. Also, you need a letter from your supervisor attesting to the fact of, that you actually do supervisory work, um, but that person doesn't have to be certified. And I guess the challenging thing for a lot of people is that you need to write a personal letter to the national committee stating why you think that you deserve to be a professional broadcast engineer based upon your experience, education, background, and training. Sometimes people talking about themselves makes it a little more challenging. Um, but this is not a difficult area. And I would encourage any of those folks who are senior certified and have 20 years experience, get the uh, 
get the letters and request to be upgraded to CPBE. We have four levels of specialist certifications. And as I said, these are really designed to allow you to take and um, demonstrate your knowledge in a particular area of, uh, of broadcasting. 8VSB, AM directional, ATSC3, digital radio broadcast. 8 VSB is uh, mainly dealing with transport, uh, transport, and this was part of the standard that was used with the original HD TV. That's how we got signals from the uh, facilities out to the transmitter. And there's still a lot of that around because now everyone has gone over to uh, ATSC next gen TV yet. The AM directional specialist is uh, it's a little more comprehensive and requires a little bit more knowledge because it covers pretty much everything from phasers to AM radiators uh, to make necessary corrections and measurements to uh, properly adjust the AM systems. Today we have less and less AM broadcast stations, but we still have a number of them and that level of expertise is actually going down as people retire. So this would actually be a good specialist certification to have if you are applying for a job at an AM uh, facility. Our newest specialist uh, Exam is the ATSC-3. This covers the uh, operation and maintenance of the next-gen TV, um, understanding how to construct the next-gen facility, and being familiar with the various protocols used with uh, ATSC-3 and with the ATSC-3 standards documents. ATSC-3 is a kind of a Swiss army knife of standards. Uh, there's so many ways that you can uh, put things together that uh, there's probably no one way of doing things. So this, uh, this is another one of those areas. It's still fairly new. It's, you know, 10 year, within 10 years of, uh, getting started. So we're, the country is building out more and more next gen facilities. And as more facilities are constructed, the, um, the need and the uh, demand for someone with an ATSC three specialist certification will probably be uh, required. Digital radio broadcast is uh, HD radio, basically. It's uh, need to have knowledge of importers and exporters, various methods of combining analog and digital transmitters, delivering digital audio signals and data to transmitter sites. And an important piece of this is AM and FM FCC rules and being able to monitor digital signals and bandwidth requirements. To apply for a specialist certification, you must currently hold a certification at the broadcast engineer, senior broadcast engineer, or professional broadcast engineer uh, level. So this means that you have to have a certification at the five-year level, the 10-year level, or the 20-year level to sit for a specialist. Surprise, surprise, I haven't taken a test in years. So why should I, so why should I test? Well, the, the tests are not designed to be a gotcha. It's basically to allow you to demonstrate your proficiency in your craft. So, uh, 
the exams are designed to reflect what you do every day and utilize the tools that you use every day. The questions are prepared by broadcast engineers. So these are actually coming from practical working engineers in most cases. And the examinations are based upon 50 multiple choice questions. And they're selected to reflect the particular discipline being tested. There's a lot of carryover information from one level of certification to another. So some questions you may see if you go through the procedure of starting the five year and you go to 10 year and take a couple of different uh, certifications, you may see some of those same questions show up in different exams. And that's mainly because they're applicable for multi uh, levels of certification. And as you increase in your knowledge in the five and 10 year, the level of difficulty increases because you're expected to know more. And this is one of the areas that you really need to take in um, always being looking at your professional development. And when we uh, get to the senior level, generally those are more senior people within an organization and they're more into supervision and management. So there are supervision and management and safety questions that are um, added to those uh, senior level exams. So there was the question then, when and where are the tests given? The exams are given throughout the local, through the local chapters four times a year, February, June, August, November. In the past, we've given exams during the NAB Spring Convention in Las Vegas. Since NAB has been on hiatus for the past two years, uh, the committee has decided that we will, and not knowing how many people are going to show up, we decided not to have exams given during the NAB Spring Convention this year. But we will continue in the future. We're just uh, not going to have it this year because of just coming back from COVID. There's a lot of variety in the way that exams can be uh, proctored. Can be proctored through universities, colleges, technical schools, as well as offices of educational professionals. Uh, and we've had people certified throughout the world. So We've made accommodations to cover uh, basically any type of situation that comes up, even in foreign languages. We've modified some exams to allow uh, non-English speaking uh, people to take the exams and become certified. So the last bullet there is if you're willing, we will find a way. And, Megan has been very creative in doing that. That is one of the things that we uh, were trying to figure out what we were going to do when COVID hit and everything got shut down and everybody was self-isolating and no one was being able to get in the same rooms. This was before even the mask uh, mandates and those type of things. But Megan came up with a way of using uh, technology to proctor exams. So. This is a perfect example of uh, we continue to certify people all during the, the COVID outbreak. So once you become certified, the, your job's not over. It's just actually just beginning because you uh, need to continue to develop your skills and your knowledge. So as soon as you become certified, you need to start working on the recertification. And we have on the website, the um, kind of a chart that allows you to take and do uh, different activities and knowledge, uh, gain additional knowledge in different areas that you can put into your uh, recertification application. You need to recertify every five years, and that's uh, 
very similar to a lot of other entities that uh, have renewable certifications. Five years seems to be pretty much of a minimum time to uh, work on your career development and recertify. So what do you do once you get certified? Well, you can use the SBE certified logo on your business cards, letterhead, resume, website, and email signature. You can go to the SBE website and download the certified logo, and it has uh, criteria on how it is to be utilized and displayed. So you need to uh, follow the instructions to make sure that you're displaying the certified logo properly. So who's behind the program? You get SBE, but what does SBE mean? Well, it's the basically the certification committee of the national uh, organization. The chair is appointed by the SBE president committee is comprised of uh, 12 working engineers who meet in person twice a year and have been until COVID hit and correspond frequently through email and throughout the rest of the year. There's always things that uh, are being done. Questions need to be updated. Questions become obsolete need to be purged out of the database and uh, also, the National Certification Committee works in conjunction with the local chapter certification chairs and committees and the National Certification Director to ensure that we have a viable program that uh, allows us to keep current with uh, the technology as it changes. The National Committee and the National Staff are committed to the program and broadcast engineering profession. The chapter certification chairman have dedicated many, many hours and those who have ever been a cert chapter certification chairman know that there's a lot of work that goes on. Uh, sometimes it's easy, sometimes not so much because you still have to schedule uh, requested exams, get them in, monitor them, send them back. And uh, not only that, you also, uh, it's not just the exams, but as people take and progress, uh, the recertification has to go through the uh, chapter certification chairs also. So there's a fair amount of work that the chapter certification chairman do and also the national committee because the national committee has its own responsibility to ensure the integrity of the program and also do reviews of the application as they come in. So what's a passing grade on the exams? 70%? on all levels except the senior specialist networking engineer, which requires 84%. And what happens if you don't pass? For a reduced rate, you can retake the exam as early as the next scheduled exam. So it's not like you have to start over again. You have an opportunity to uh, just pay a basic administrative fee and sit for the exam the next cycle. Question is how long will it be once I've taken the test before I know the results? Well, the answer is it all depends. That answer varies depending on the type of test you took. If it's just the multiple choice test, then that exam can be scored fairly quickly at the national office and the results can be sent back out. If it's an exam that has an essay, then the essay has to be sent to a number of the 
certification committee for grading. So depending, these are volunteers, remember, so depending on what their schedules are like, it sometimes it takes a little while for them to get the grades and send it back to the national office for the certification to be complete. So once you're notified that you passed, then you will receive a certification card and a certificate of cert certification uh, suitable for uh, framing that you can hang on your wall. And your certification is good for five years. We'll also notify your employer or anyone else that you designate of your certification. This is something that you have to request at the time of your application. If you're looking to let your employer know that uh, you've successfully completed an exam in the level of certification you have, you can put that on your application and the national office on letter SBE letterhead will send a letter to your employer notifying them of your successful completion of the certification. The exams are open book. So the question is, how many books can you bring to the exam? Well, probably not as many as used to be brought in for the exams because we've changed the, uh, the way that people can look up information now. Uh, the essay portion is closed book and you may not use any uh, <clears throat> additional help when you're taking the essay portion of the exam. So are calculators and computers allowed during the test? Well, beginning in April of 2017, the internet can now be utilized during exams during the open book period. Examinees are responsible for procuring the internet feed. Uh, you need to bring in a portable uh, Wi-Fi hotspot or have a network connection. We've specifically excluded the proctors from being responsible for supplying that network feed. Uh, and that's only to be fair to our volunteers who are proctors not to have to worry about that. So if you want to take advantage, you can still bring in the books. You don't have to use uh, a network connection. But if you do choose that, then you're responsible. Most people with smartphones nowadays that have a data plan can utilize that as their network connection. So once you now become certified, does I guarantee you a pay increase? Well, not necessarily. Um, it may give you an advantage, uh, as, as Conrad said, that uh, for someone who is certified uh, and you're competing with other people or even letting your employer know that you've gone the extra mile, you've demonstrated proficiency of your knowledge within a certain level of certification and it's something you can be proudly attach those letters behind your name. So this is kind of to the end here. I, um, Megan is online and she and I are both available if you have any questions. Hey, Ralph, this is George Marshall. Can I jump in here for a second? Sure. Okay. I just want to point out that I took exams and got certification levels, even though I was already employed, because as a self-taught engineer, sometimes I didn't know, did I really measure up? Did I really qualify for this? And the exams gave me that confidence. So I want to put that out there that sometimes it's for your own self-assurance. Good point. 
Hi, it's Jeff. I just wanted to see if there's anybody on this uh, webinar right now who is seriously considering getting certified, especially somebody uh, who's new or young. Uh, would you unmute and let us know who you are? Okay, so <laughs> I don't hear anyone else. Uh, someone wants to chime in, but let's say, um, oh, I've been certified for over 30 years. Uh, I was young when I took my test, but if I am seriously interested in taking one of the um, entry level, uh, uh, you know, a CBT, a CBNT, something like that, what would be for New York, for our chapter, what would be the next step that I would want to do? What level of certification you currently have? Uh, well, no, this is uh, um, this is hypothetical. I want to put something out there for uh, somebody who's new to the chapter. So let's say there's no, I have no certification, and okay. I want to get my first certification. And I'm on this webinar right now. Is what is my next step? What do I do? I'm interested in taking one of them. I'm really not sure which is the right one for me. Maybe I'm a student over at Hofstra. So um, where do I begin? Depending on what your background is, I mean, I, it's hard to, you know, define what what people's knowledge is. If if you're saying that they have no broadcast experience and no uh, engineering uh, electronics knowledge, then probably the operator um, courses are probably the certification that might be good to get started because that gives you a basic operation of how a station, a radio and TV station operates, some of the FCC requirements, you know, the regulatory part, also making measurements properly, and also uh, learning how uh, the different pieces of the broadcast plant come together. So if you, you're starting from scratch, that might be a good way just to get your feet wet. Okay, so I'm interested in becoming a TV operator. Um, what do I want to do? Do I want to get some test materials first? Uh, where do I go next? Uh, let me jump in there. Um, one thing that we didn't necessarily cover in this PowerPoint that I'm recognizing now is that so for the operator levels, the radio and the television operator, it is unique that we have a handbook that covers um, all of the information that would be basically covered in the exam and any information that you should know um, to be able to um, jump into that area. So what we do is there's a handbook that you purchase and then you study from the handbook. And then when you're ready to take the test, you would send in a card in the back that has um, this kind of a rede redemption of the exam. So you send that in to me and then you choose whether or not you want to take the test during the normal exam cycle, or that is unique that um, like a master control operator or higher at the station is able to proctor those tests too, or any of num number of things that were covered on here, like a clergy person, a professor, mm -hmm. um, a, an instructor, that type of thing is able to proctor those tests. So um, that exam is 50 multiple choice questions. Again, all of the questions contained within that exam is contained within the book. At the back of the book, there's, I think, 70 sample questions that you can also take to kind of get um, the feel of what the test is going to be like. Um, that test is only one hour allotted and it is closed book where all the other exams are open book during the multiple, multiple choice. That one is, I think the committee years ago when they created that was, um, under the impression that since the book contained all the information, which is unique um, in our certification situation, that um, they should be able to um, take the test without any, without having the book handy to give them the answers to that. So, um, and that's a 70% pass rate for that exam also. Um, so we would find that book at sbe.org under certification? Absolutely, yes. Okay, so, and also if you have some experience, you're working in the field right now and you wanna get maybe one of the higher levels, you would go to the same area to sbe.org certification. And uh, would you register right there on the site uh, to take the test? So um, the way that would work is 
you would go to our website under certification and then applications and um, pull down the application that corresponds to the certification that you want to take, um, fill it out and send it in to me. Um, we don't have it set up on the website at this time where it's a direct send into uh, through the website. You'd have to um, print it off or save and email it to me. Um, but what would happen is then um, once I receive it, it gets sent out for approval. Um, once you're approved, you're notified that you're approved to take the test and um, you would get set up at the next local session or whichever one you choose. Um, we have some people that are applying for the November session right now too, um, but we do have June and August as well available. Um, and then closer to the date of the, the application, uh, closer to the date of the exam, um, I notify the local certification chairmen um, that uh, who's taken the test, <laughs> who's taken the test in your area, and they contact you to set up a date, time, and place that works for everyone. Um, usually within the exam time period, which is usually about ten days, um, but uh, we typically will work outside of that too because everybody has different schedules nowadays, especially. Um, and then you would take the test. Test would be sent back to me. The results are sent out to the examinee. We only give pass fail results. We don't give um, percentages. Uh, and then upon passing, you get your certification card and your certificate and you hold that certification for five years. Um, and then um, if you don't, then uh, again, you're the only one that knows that you did not pass that test um, other than me and you have the opportunity to retake it um, with a time schedule that works for you. Um, and the local certification chairman, if that's the case. And sometimes we can work out um, maybe testing a little bit sooner too. I know some positions um, would like to, like job positions um, might want to hold the certification sooner than having to wait for a next exam cycle, so. So we're right now at the beginning of a cycle. So right now, today's date is March 17th. And the last day to apply uh, for a test is April? 15th, I think. 15th yes. and then the test is somewhere in June June 3rd through 13th so okay so uh, this is a perfect time for everybody who's on this call who's thinking about certification to start the ball rolling you got you got one month to start uh, start this going so do not avoid it uh, it, it is very beneficial as you've seen through this presentation and yet uh, once again I want to uh, open it to any last minute questions here from uh, from everybody who's uh, attending today. And Jeff, let's not forget that once you pass your certification, if you use the cert preview and you use and you pass this, the certification fee, we'll reimburse you. That's Good what point, we do George. with some of the money. Yeah, we got we got some money in our account uh, and uh, some of the memberships that all the folks pay go back into our local account. And that's there for a reason like this to help uh, pay for your certification. Um, anyone else? Yeah, we have a question over here. Um, our semester ends around the middle of May. And what we're, we would like to explore the opportunity of doing is to, to find out a way we can have the CRO test offered as our uh, spring semester training course for the radio station um, wraps up. Because what we do is we make every new member of the station take our own kind of our own version of the CRO. CRO. So if there was a way to streamline that testing process and uh, you know make it so we could even do it on campus, that might, to uh, really get a lot of people idea, yeah. involved and interested in doing it. Um, we can definitely do that. We have a lot of schools that uh, are doing that nowadays. So what the process would be would, uh, what other schools have done is that they would purchase the handbooks and then when the students are ready to take the test, they would send them in the cards in to me. Um, an instructor there can proctor the test or if it's, available for George to proctor the, the, the exams in a group setting that can happen as well, but an instructor there can proctor the test in a group setting um, for that exam for any of either of the operator tests. Um, I would just need um, an adequate amount of time to be able to generate the test, to send the books out and then to generate the test, um, especially with NAB coming up um, and a lot of schools have the same time period. So, they're all uh, contacting me now to try and get things set up. So it's just a matter of that. So, but yeah, if you can contact, if you want more information, just contact me and we can get that set up. All right, let, we'll chat offline after this. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. Anyone, anyone, anyone? Um, 
Jeff, oops, sorry. Go ahead, Michael. Oh, thank you. Um, so, so just to kind of like clear the, the uh, air, I, I guess um, could we, could we get a um, a a, a, a certification such as such as a, a CRO certification while we're still in in college, or is that like a postgraduate thing? Okay. Well, I think uh, uh, I can't speak really for Dennis, but I'm going to. I don't know if anyone <laughs> met met Dennis. I think Dennis had a certification before he was out of high school. Oh wow. Yeah, he was fifteen. We have a number 15. of high schools that are utilizing the handbook. So absolutely, high school, college, it's an entry level. There's no experience required. Oh, the, more the better, awesome. right? Awesome. Okay, sweet. <laughs> yeah, I, oh. I think I think Dennis was fifteen or sixteen. <laughs> Anyone else? Last one. I I lied about saying last one before. Hey Jeff, I I just had a quick question. Megan, can you speak a little bit more about the cert preview? Yeah. What, what levels that's available for? Yes. Uh, we have Cert Preview, which is our sample test software. It's software that you purchase and download onto your computer, and it'll give you an idea of what to expect on the exam. It'll go through a, a test question, a 50 multiple choice question or test. Um, and it, you can go back and review what questions you missed, um, see what the right answer is, that type of thing. Um, we are... Currently, so that's available for all levels of certification except for the operators. Since those two have the handbook, those are out of the running for the cert preview. Um, we are actually in the process of, of updating that software. Um, right now it's a download and um, the, the new process will be that it will be a web-based software. So you just go online, use your name and password and it can access it anytime that you have access to the um, internet. Uh, Trying to think, like I said, they'll give you an idea of what to expect on the test. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, our database questions are um, the number that we have in our actual exam database are much lar larger than that, um, that of what we have on the cert preview. So it's not going to, you're not going to take a, a cert preview sample question test, and every question on there will not be on the actual exam too. Um, so just keep that in mind. One more thing I wanted to mention though also is um, for instance, recertification credit like CRIM. Um, by being on this test or by on this um, chapter meeting, you earn half a credit towards your recertification too. So already um, you want you can start earning towards that recertification. Once you re uh, get certified, you want to start um, writing down the things that uh, will add towards the points in order to recertify. Sorry, I just repeated the same thing a few different times. But Megan, isn't there a form on the website where you can go ahead and log that stuff? There is, yeah. So everybody has their own way of doing it, um, but we do have an Excel spreadsheet and you also have access on our website to a form uh, that you can print and uh, write down on there. So every time you go to a chapter meeting, you can write the date on there. Um, by being employed in the industry, you get credits for that attending NAB or any other conferences or conventions um, by uh, viewing our web extra, which is our chapter meeting for SBE national. You get credits for that. By being an SBE member, you get credits for that. And it's throughout the five years of your certification. So the only su suggestion that I would have is don't wait until the five years is up for you to say, oh crap, what chapter meeting did I go to at that time? Because you're probably not gonna remember if you did not write it down. I would it. Good information, great information. Yeah, I great idea. Say. And I'd like to thank Ralph. Yes, thank you, Megan. Megan Clapp for uh, for hosting us this evening and learned a lot about our certification. Don't forget, uh, George Marshall is our local chapter, brand new, brand new certification chairman with 22 years. Good job. And, and remember, yeah, remember, all our contact information is on the website. Right. Right. I, I work pretty hard to keep the website up, up to date. And also, uh, if we can say hi to all the folks over at Hofstra, welcome uh, to our- You're welcome. Uh, hi, guys. Yeah. Hi, guys. Next hi. generation, we need you. Us old fogies, we need some young blood. 
All right, everybody. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you in a month, uh, April 14th. I will be hosting. Won't that be exciting? Uh, Sprite Media, digital signage for the broadcast facility. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Thanks for all, thanks, Megan. Happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody, and we'll see you next month. Take care. Thanks for joining us. Please remember to subscribe to SBE15 New York City.